Hi, welcome. This is an introduction to social and political philosophy. My name is Mark Thorsby, and in this video we're going to be taking a look at um, critical theory, and in particular, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, critical theory here refers to essentially a, a vein of Marxism um, that is initiated in the early part of the 20th century. So, welcome back everyone. I hope everyone's doing well, and that I hope you're... Um, you're really getting into this stuff. This week, what we're going to be talking about is introduction to critical theory. So what I want to do here is there's a lot of information and a lot of ideas that I want to sort of pack into and congeal into a central critique. Um, and the critique today concerns the question of reason. What we're going to really be focusing on is we're going to be taking a look at uh, Max Horkheimer's book, The Eclipse of Reason, which is loosely based off his more um, scholarly work, The Dialect of Enlightenment, in which Horkheimer describes that in contemporary society and modern life, reason has changed and shifted such that uh, our society has become extremely instrumental in terms of its orientation. So, um, and, and Horkheimer thinks this explains some of the problems. So let me, we'll get to that here in a minute, but let me just sort of jump into it. The first point here is Marxism after Marx. Um, and I'm not going to, this isn't a detailed lesson on Marxism, so uh, there's a lot of, lot more fabulous and uh, really important events that occurred that I'm not going to talk about. So this is not an authoritative history of Marxism. But essentially what happens? Well, after uh, Marx uh, publishes Das Kapital, he goes on to publish um, three volumes of Das Kapital. Um, but what we looked at last time is still the most central part, piece of that story. Um, essentially, of course, we know the Bolshevik Revolution occurs. Marx, in his letters, was excited by this prospect. He believed that perhaps the, the movement towards class revolution and then eventually um, systemic economic re revolution would occur, but it never does. And so a lot of the people who like Marx um, begin to wonder why was Marx wrong in terms of his prediction of a revolution related to class. Um, and in economics. And that never seems to materialize, especially when you look at the sort of bastions of economic capitalism like the um, United Kingdom or the United States in particular. If you look at these locations, Marxism never really takes hold. Uh, there is, to some degree, a, a movement of socialism in the early part of the 20th century, but it's short-lived. Now, what's interesting here is that by 1922, we see a distinction here between vulgar Marxism, and when we talk about vulgar Marxism, that's what the European Marxists, uh, that's how they referred to uh, the Marxism within the Soviet Union. Um, Eastern Bloc Marxism. Uh, the, the thinkers, remember last time when we looked at Marx, I made a differentiation here between Marx understood as a humanist versus Marx understood as a scientist. I think the, Euro, the, the Western Euro, European Marxist, um, the Frankfurt School here, they're essentially the humanist side, uh, whereas the, um, well, I don't know, I don't think that the Marxist of the Soviet Union were very good Marxist in general, at least not once it became a question of, pol of politics, uh, especially after Lenin. Lenin certainly did understand Marx very clearly, very keenly, um, and I think there's a sort of, I think there's a sort of, uh, there's a vein of Marx within Lenin's work. But after Lenin, I don't think we see that in the Soviet Union whatsoever. Now, so there's this distinction that gets made between the vulgar Marxist and what I'm calling here the Frankfurt School. Now, I need to talk a little bit about the Frankfurt School, and I'll do that in a minute. But the Frankfurt School was essentially a series of scholars in 1922 got together, initially at a conference. Uh, and here's a picture of them right here at the 1922 conference. And not all of them are considered the Frankfurt School, but essentially what they engaged at in this initial conference in 22 was the question of why did Marx's project fail? Um, 
Um, and it seems to have it seemed to have something to do with consciousness and class consciousness. That is, the, all the the sort of economic predictions that Marx gives seems to have come forward, seems to have actually followed through. But despite the sort of economic um, increased polarization of wealth between the classes, and if you think by the twenties, this is in full bore, the Roaring Twenties. Um, you have to ask, well, why weren't more people motivated towards class revolution? And the Frankfurt School theorists essentially think it must be a problem with consciousness because Marx's original theory stipulated that prior to there being a revolution, right, the proletariat, uh, that is, the workers must become conscious of their situation. And this, this state of consciousness is what allows the proletariat to emerge. Now remember, there's the capitalist and then the antithesis or the antithetical class are the proletariats. The proletariats never happen, and that seems to be because the class, there's never been a class consciousness um, for Europeans or Americans to awaken from or awaken to. So the Frankfurt School, essentially, they organized this in Frankfurt, Germany, and eventually they create an institute um, related uh, to the university, and eventually becomes known as the Frankfurt School. And the Frankfurt School is a whole series of different thinkers. You've got psychologists, you've got artists, you've got philosophers, political scientists, historians, and so forth. A whole interdisciplinary network of individuals working on this problem of consciousness, ultimately with this singular goal um, that comes out of the Marxist tradition. Okay, now and that's what we were going to refer to here as critical theory. Okay, now what exactly is critical theory? Because you're going to see here that the Frankfurt School is just one element within the critical theory domain. Critical theory here refers to well, let's take a look at this one. Critical theory in the traditional sense, or let's think about this traditional theories are explanatory in nature, right? A traditional theory seeks to explain or at least set out the conditions for an explanation for some sort of event or occurrence. Um, that's what a traditional theory does. But what does a critical theory do? A critical theory seeks emancipation, is emancipatory, not simply explanatory. That is, the goal isn't simply to explain, but the goal is liberation itself. You can see it's a very humanistic idea. So critical theory here refers to um, um, the theoretical investigation that could lead to emancipation. And emancipation precisely in the terms that we've laid out in an earlier section on Marx. Um, that's the sense of emancipation we're talking about. Now, don't worry, we're gonna come back to, at the end of this course, we're gonna come back to sort of the liberal, because you can see here all the philosophy we're talking about today is essentially an attack on liberalism and social contract theory. And so we're, we're gonna come back to social contract theory for those of you who are starting to get nervous and starting to think, uh-oh, we're, we're becoming sort of socialist in this course. Not so, but we'll see that this is an important critique for understanding um, a defense of liberalism that I think we have to make, okay? So this is what critical theory is, and the Frankfurt School theorists are essentially involved in this, um, this project we might call critical theory. Uh, but there's even more people who are involved in it simply than the Frankfurt School theorists. Now, I've already mentioned here the, the key problem here is the problem of class consciousness. Um, and we'll talk a lot about that today. Because uh, we'll see that Horkheimer, Max Horkheimer, gives us an answer, at least a provisional explanation for why class consciousness hasn't actually arrived. Okay, the, the other thing I worth mentioning here is that when we talk about the the critical theory of the Frankfurt School in particular, there's a Freudian infusion into Marxism. One of the things that occurs is, um, since the time of Marx up until 1922, um, Freud's psychoanalytic theory has sort of taken the world by storm. And this idea, that is psychology for the first time, becomes a, a, a prominent discussion. Keep in mind that before Freud, Though people talked about psychology, psychology wasn't a formal scientific discipline. If anything, I think psychology was essentially a, um, well, let's see here. I guess psychology is essentially a sort of philosophical discussion up until Freud. Now, because Freud seeks to, uh, to, to link the discussion of psychology with um, experimental data. Now, I have to be a little bit careful because it's not too experimental. 
uh, but at least it's empirical to some extent. Uh, or it seeks to be. Now, what the Frankfurt School theorists do is they also entertain the possibility, well, maybe part of the problem in terms of class consciousness is Marx doesn't have this concept of um, natural drives and psychological drives. He doesn't have a psychological system worked out. If we combine Marx's uh, discussion of material economics with Freud's theory of um, psychology, perhaps we'll be in a better position to explain um, why it is human beings or why it is uh, there is no consciousness of class division. So uh, in, in a real uh, operational sense. So so what, one of the things the Frankfurt School theorists do is they infuse Marx's ideas with Freudian psychoanalytic um, with the structure of uh, Freudian psychoanalytics. So that allows them to begin to uncover maybe there's other reasons why class consciousness hasn't emerged, okay? So let's here move here. Now, who are some of the key thinkers? Now, I just, I'm not gonna go through these. These are some of the key thinkers, both within critical theory in general, uh, and then with the Frankfurt School in particular. So let me start here with George Lukacs. He's, even though he was actually there at the 1922 uh, seminar, he was not, he's not a part of the, uh, he's not typically considered a member of the Frankfurt School of Theory, but he wrote a very important work here called History and Class Consciousness, in which he, you know, really makes this the singular important question. And I believe History and Class Consciousness was published in 23, so the year after the seminar. But it's important to know here that Lukács here was um, politically active. So for him, it's not an academic exercise. Um, and this, of course, would eventually result in his jailing. Um, and you can you can go online and take a look at that. But he's a very, very important figure, especially he talks a lot about the reification of commodities, which may, if we get time, we'll talk about. Um, other important thinkers here is Frederick Pollock, who at, some, at one point became the director of the Institute. Max Horkheimer is one of the key thinkers, uh, I think probably the most influential. Um, uh, and he wrote The Dialect of Enlightenment and The Eclipse of Reason, among other works. We'll be talking about The Eclipse of Reason, which is something I think of a sophomoric version of A Dialect of, of Enlightenment. This is his sort of magnum opus. Now, The Dialect of Enlightenment was actually co-authored with Theodore Adorno. Um, and Theodore Adorno also wrote another book called Negative Dialectics. Horkheimer and Adorno are really, really pivotal and important figures. Unfortunately, we're not reading Adorno here, uh, but I encourage you to take a look at his work as well. Eric Fromm is another important thinker. Um, he wrote a great book called Escape from Freedom. He's actually a psychoanalyst. Uh, he actually wrote a book on Marx and Freud. So he's the key thinker who's trying to infuse Marxism with the dis this discussion of um, psychological drives and, and this sort of thing. And so he's a really key thinker. Um, this book Escape from Freedom doesn't talk about Marxism in particular though, but it's a very interesting thesis which I'll share with you. His general thesis is that sanity is actually a form of escape, that is escaping from freedom. And his idea is that um, if, we, if we could truly recognize how free we are, uh, and then we would ultimately we would become too difficult to live because freedom is so overwhelming. And so his idea here is that in order for us to function psychologically, we have to create, um, if you will, psychological layers that contain our capacity to be free such that we don't feel free. Uh, and so that means, conversely, that the person who's in severe neurosis is actually approaching freedom. So it's a very interesting sort of thesis. Another great book of his is called Being and Becoming, which I think is pretty important. Um, so those are some those are two important words from from Herbert Marcuse. We're going to talk a little bit about him today, uh, but his key works here is Eros and Civilization. Again, you can see the psychological element, and then also One Dimensional Man. Uh, Adorno, we mentioned Walter Benjamin. Um, he's a pretty important thinker. I think he his influence extends beyond Marxism and extends into the philosophy of language and. Um, even though we can count him as a member of the Frankfurt School, his work is ultimately, um, I think, sort of explodes beyond um, this question of class consciousness. But uh, uh, on his key works here is Illuminations and also the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. He has a great essay called um, uh, 
artist as producer and he sort of looks at the question of what does art what is art when we have material reproduction and we have mechanization and so forth uh, think about it when we can print off any painting in the world simply with the click of a button at what point or what does that do to our conception and understanding about the value of art. So that's something that Benjamin talks a lot about. Pretty interesting thing here. Tragically, he was Jewish. In fact, most of all of these people were Jewish. Um, and tragically, he tried to escape the Nazis. I um, mean, he was stopped at the Spanish border, at which point he didn't think he could escape, and so he committed suicide. Uh, so a very tragic life. Uh, another. Now, these are some of the more old school Frankfurt School thinkers. Jürgen Habermas, who who essentially becomes, is sort of kind of the mid-range thinker. He's really, really, really important thinker. Um, and he writes a book called The Theory of Communicative Action, among other works. He's still actively writing today, though he's, um, though he, though I think his key moment um, was really this work in this theory of communicative action. Now, Jürgen Habermas, one of the things we'll see with Habermas and some of the Frankfurt School theorists is that they're not so quick to dismiss representative government in the same fashion. That is... Um, especially Habermas wants to defend liberalism to a certain degree, and he wants to defend um, the institutions. He wants to defend this idea that representative democratic institutions are still a good thing. Um, so we'll see there's nuances developing here, at least in terms of what we looked at last time. Um, now these, the last three thinkers here are what we might call the most contemporary thinkers. Agnes Heller. Um, Agnes is actually a friend of mine. I really, really love her. Um, she was also my thesis, um, one of the judges in my thesis for my thesis, and, uh, and for whom I learned all of my, all I know about Marx. And so she's a wonderful thinker. She's a Hungarian philosopher. Um, in the night after the Hungarian um, uh, takeover by the Soviet Union, um, she, as a Marxist, was actually exiled and forced to flee. Um, and even today, uh, Agnes still sort of. Um, is faced with mounting political, um, uh, with mounting sort of criticisms from the political sphere. So, uh, but Agnes is a wonderful thinker, and I encourage you to go on YouTube and li listen to some of her lectures. Uh, she's a wonderful person. Nancy Fraser as well. Um, you can see that one of the things that seems to occur in critical theory is critical theory moves from this very sort of question of class consciousness all the way into the consciousness of, for instance, gender studies by the time you get to Nancy Fraser, uh, who has a book here called Unruly Practices, Power, Discourse, and Gender in Contemporary Social Theory. So uh, gender theory, queer theory, all of these sorts of theories you may have heard of are fit within the rubric of critical theory because they seek emancipation. Um, though I think they're further removed from this Marxist... Um, seed to which they may have sprung. Um, finally, there's another great thinker here, Axel Honneth, who I'm very interested in his work. And he writes a great book called The Struggle for Recognition, The Moral Grammar of Social Conflicts. And these thinkers, I just tried to pick out the books that I think are really interesting. I encourage you to read for further research, especially if you wanted to do your research paper on these guys. Um, but these are all great thinkers. Now, and by the way, the, the, all, almost all of these later thinkers here um, have taught um, at the New School, uh, which is sort of the home for continental philosophy and critical theory here in the United States, um, the New School in New York, um, my alma mater. So anyway, let's keep going. There's a great place here if you go to Marxist.org. I'll just click on here. Well, I won't click on it. But if you go to this link here, you can also read all about all of these different thinkers and really dig into some of the history of the Frankfurt School. It's a rich history. Um, and it's an exciting history because I think it reminds me, at least when I first heard of um, the Frankfurt School, the thing that I thought found really um, uh, riveting is the idea is here you have um, philosophical theory with that's true who, which is whose goal is truly emancipatory in nature. Um, and that's exciting. Um, it's it's sort of philosophy for the living and I love it. Anyway, let's keep going here. Um, what I, let's talk about the eclipse of realism with Max Horkheimer. Um, well, hold on, was there one thing I was going to mention to you about the Frankfurt School? Oh, I guess I should mention here, because I mentioned the New School. The, uh, the One of the things that occurred with the Frankfurt School is, is in Frankfurt, Germany, most of the thinkers, the intellectuals here in this picture are Jewish, 
Um, after the rise of the National Socialist Party, that is the Nazis, most of these thinkers were either were either interned or forced to flee um, Germany. Most of them left Frankfurt and first went to Paris, eventually settled in New York. While they were in New York, they began a small school called the University in Exile, which would later become the New School for Social Research. Um, so, and then, of course, after the war, many of them returned home. So, um, so it's sort of an so it's really actually sort of tragic. But one of the things we'll see here as we talk about the eclipse of reason, you can see here's the cover of the book. Horkheimer here is concerned with articulating why it is. Uh, the National Socialists and the Fascists are able to take over in World War II and obviously inflict such devastating moral harm to the world, it's, it's almost unimaginable. So the real goal here of Horkheimer's is to explain um, what, how it is we've gotten here. Um, and he thinks that we've gotten here essentially because reason has changed. That is, we have an eclipse of reason okay so let's sort of go through this well what exactly is reason is the first question we have to ask now um, obviously there's many different ways to answer this but there's two types of reason that Horkheimer distinguishes here um, the first one is that this is what we might call subjective reason now subjective reason or what sometimes is referred to as instrumental reason instrumental reasoning is where reason is always a means towards some sort of end right that is for instance we have a purpose and then we 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 have a purpose we want something let's say for instance i want it to become a millionaire and then i use my reason to calculate some sort of way to get that goal that end so in some for subjective reasoning reason is a means it's an instrument it's a tool okay um and Here's what's the, let's contrast that with the second type of reason here we might call objective reason. Now, here reason is treated as a measuring rod. That is, reason allows us, uh, here objective reason is the idea that reason allows us to determine what our ends should be, right? Or what our purposes should be. So here we say in subjective reason, reason becomes a means or an instrument. In objective reason, reason becomes something of a criterion. It becomes a way to distinguish which ends are worth pursuing and which purposes are worth having. Okay. Now, what he's going to ultimately argue, though, is that even though both of these have sort of always existed in human life, that uh, through a dialectical process of economics and class, and I'm sorry, and shifting of consciousness, what has occurred is that objective reason has essentially dropped out of the equation. And all we're left with is today is subjective reasoning. So this distinction has become important, okay? So, in, and I think as I go through the lecture today, I think you'll get a better sense of what we're talking about. Okay, so here's some of the ways that um, Horkheimer distinguishes. So objective reasoning focuses on concepts, right? Understanding what the concept is. Think about, for instance, Plato, where Plato says, what is justice, right? That is an operation of objective reasoning in which the focus is the articulation of an essential idea or an essential concept. Now, subjective reasoning, by contrast, since it's means-oriented, right is ultimately is is not focused on on identifying what concepts mean but really is focused on calculating probabilities because calculating the, that is the probabilities to attain a specific end or goal we get this great quote from Horkheimer here which is quote the theory of objective reason to not focus on the coordination of behavior and aim but on concepts Subjective reason proves to be the ability to calculate probability and thereby coordinate the right means with the given end, right? So what do we get here? Is what we have is that both forms of reason have always existed, but today all of these different forms of reason seem to have been reduced down into just the subjective um, instrumental form. And then this reduction has led or contributed to the crisis of class consciousness. And, and that's really what the Eclipse of Reason and the Dialectic of Enlightenment is, is trying to articulate, is the idea that um, the inability for people to awaken to the commodification of each other, um, in the, using the Marxist term vernacular, um, is related to actually a much deeper story. It's not simply because you, we need more slogans and more pamphlets, 
The problem of emancipation is ultimately seated in the problem of consciousness, which is dependent upon this idea of subjective reasoning. So what he wants to do is sort of uh, is, is sort of awaken up our understanding of what all of that means. So let me move here to number eight. So let's think about the crisis of class consciousness of what we're talking about. And there's a couple quotes here, and I sort of walk through it with you. The present crisis of reason consists fundamentally in the fact that at a certain point, thinking either became incapable of conceiving such objectivity at all, or began to negate it as a delusion. Okay, now let me, I, now that I put that quote up there, I realize I need to do maybe a little more background work to explain what that means. The crisis of reason is this. It's ultimately the idea that uh, we've lost the very category of objectivity. I almost dropped my coffee. We've lost the very category of objectivity. The idea being that reason can deliver us knowledge about the world that isn't simply based on our own perspective. Now, by contrast, because subjective reason is a means, the purposes towards which we seek cannot be evaluated using subjective reasoning. That is, moral judgments are reduced to forms of emotivism, personal objections. There are no real moral problems, only subjective illusions. Let me see if I can make a little bit more sense of this for you. Because subjective reasoning is means and oriented, that means that every individual ultimately chooses the purpose. Maybe it would be helpful if we would go up here, right? Uh, let's go back over here, right? Okay, so that means that every person picks a purpose. Now, they pick the purpose because it's subjective, right? I want um, to become a millionaire, but that purpose isn't necessarily a purpose that, that that's uh, given to me through thinking about the universe or through science. It's simply my own personal view. Um, and reason is, is inert when it comes to the question of purpose or end and for the subjective reasoning, right? Reasoning is just a way to get to where I want to go. Now, objective reasoning supposes that reason can actually tell us what is actually true um, and that we should then determine our purposes and our ends based upon that. But you can see here, if we concede with Horkheimer, this crisis consists in the idea that we don't even have objective reasoning anymore. What we're left with is we're left with a situation in which there's no way for us to determine absolutely, correctly, objectively, whether or not such and such should be our purpose or our goal. So what occurs is that means every time I have a, if we think about moral judgments, right, and doing things morally, what happens is that all of my moral judgments get reduced to emotivism. And emotivism is basically just saying that I, yes, I agree to something, right? Uh, emotivism is, is uh, essentially a form of emotional or passioned consent but it's not but it's purely subjective right but that means that there's no real moral problems because all moral problems are basically subjective and since there is no reason can't give us an objective since there is no objective reasoning that means that I can't know whether or not your personal purposes are wrong or right they just are your personal purposes right it's ultimately this problem of cultural relativism. I'm not sure if I'm speaking very good on it. Um, hopefully as we go here, it'll become increasingly clear. So what's happened here is the subordination of reason is in direct conflict with the intellectual pioneers of the Enlightenment. Because the Enlightenment thinkers like Locke and Hobbes and Descartes, these thinkers believed that there was such a thing as objective reasoning. But... Um, Interestingly enough, what Horkheimer wants to do is tell the story about how even though these pioneers of the Enlightenment believed that we needed objective reasoning, they set, they set a, a series of dom dominoes cascading towards the eventual reduction and elimination of objective reasoning, such that reason no longer determines ends, it merely works as a means to attain specific goals or specific ends. Okay. So, what does that mean? So, well, he has this thing he calls the dialect of reason. Uh, or at least I, I want to call it the dialect of reason. Because remember the dialectical shift we talked about in our previous videos. Um, going, and if you, have, if you need a refresher on this, take a look at either the Marx video or the Hegel video that discusses this, right? Uh, 
But in the dialect of reason, what we have here is he wants to tell the story of the sort of slow transition through thesis, antithesis, synthesis, through which we see this shift from objective to subjective reasoning. Now, to just begin from the very beginning, he starts with classical philosophy, where objective reason reigns. Uh, and you can think here about Plato or Aristotle or any of these earlier thinkers, but Socrates is a great example, right? For Socrates, reason is a universal insight which should determine beliefs and regulate relations between human beings and between man and human beings and nature. So for Socrates, um, to, 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 to figure out how to live requires first and foremost the interrogation of logos, the interrogation of our reasons for acting. And the idea here is that reason is a criteria for objective truth. And the application of, that's OR here is ob objective reason, the, the application of objective reason is not neutral, okay? Now, in subjective reason um, is neutral because it doesn't care what your answer or not is. But for objective reasoning, there is a wrong and a right answer, right? That is, if we're to apply objective reasoning, that's not gonna, we're not going to get a neutral result. Um, it's in, in meaning that it's going to... The, that it's going to be a, a that objective reason will deliver conclusions um, for which we either have to accept or deny, but not ones that we can all just ignore uh, because it's not subjective. Okay. Now, objective reasoning is the base is the original basis for science, at least what we might call archaic or classical science, and I think all. I think also modern science too, but we I don't want to look to the ancient sense of of this uh, look at the um, Renaissance sense but um, for these original classical thinkers science is actually the implementation of reasoning right science is about actually implementing your objective reasons an objective reason is net net is naturally hostile to mythology and tradition because uh, mythology is essentially uh, doing something because uh, mythology is essentially some sort of narrative that seeks to tell us how to live our lives. But the problem is these narratives are culturally based. They're not based in objective reason, right? Um, where, for instance, you can think here about the entire discussion at the beginning of the term when we looked at Aristotle and his discussion. All of this is based upon objective reasoning. And it's, not, and it's against tradition because... The idea here is that we shouldn't just simply do something because we've been doing it. It's tradition for tradition's sake. The idea is that we should act based upon what re how reason guides us. Uh, the light of reason they would talk about should guide us, right? Now, in subjective reasoning, right, science becomes subordinate to speculation. Um, and this has raised some interesting questions, which unfortunately I don't think I really have time to, to dive into today. Uh, but I want you to, but that's worth thinking about how subjective reasoning changes uh, the, the way we see and the way science functions, okay? Now, by the time we get to modern philosophy here, uh, in particular, we can look at, he mentions the 16th century French philosophers, people like Montaigne, and of course, inevitably Descartes. Uh, but he thinks these philosophers, they also think that objective reasoning is important, right? But because for them, they have an abdication of religion in favor of reasoning. A great example here is Montaigne. Michel de Montan, um, who writes the essays. Um, and for those of you who haven't heard of Montaigne, you, I encourage you to go on Wikipedia or, or the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy and look him up. He's the person who invented the essay that we, we now make everyone, all of our students write uh, over and over. Um, but... Uh, Montaigne is an interesting thinker where he said he's sort of a skeptic on the one hand if you look at his um, his essay on the apology for Raymond Savon uh, Montaigne argues that that all of these things I think I know I don't really know and that the point of an essay right hence the term here is ultimately to uncover what the self does know but the idea though is even though Montaigne is skeptical of religion and he's skeptical of other philosophers um, of his day, especially the scholastic medieval philosophers, Montaigne still believes that reason is what can guide us towards truth. So even in this early period of the modern period, we still see objective reasoning in operation, right? As not only in operation, but as fundamental 
uh, for essentially every pro scientific project. Okay. Now, the characteristics in modern philosophy here is that objective reasoning comes to, but oh no, here's the, one of the things that occurs during the Reformation is that over time, reason comes to signify a conciliatory attitude. And we're going to see him talk about this, and I'll mention this in just a second here. But because one of the things that's occurring is because of the shift in the Renaissance and the Reformation, uh, where the church loses its, its sort of authority as being a le legitimate authority in terms of knowledge, right? What happens is because many people still want to be Catholics, like Montaigne still wants to be something of a Catholic, but he doesn't want to believe all this stuff that he, because the authority has been disrupted. What you see is that reason becomes a way to sort of uh, to find conciliation, uh, to, to find a, a happy medium where we can live with our traditions, but yet still pursue science. Now, but what this ultimately leads to is this idea that no doctrine is worth defending to the death. That is, for instance, that these French thinkers move into this position where Listen, while they still believe in God, they don't think that the doctrines of the church are worth killing and dying over. Uh, and you can think here about the um, Forty Years' War and its relationship between Protestantism and Catholicism. Uh, so we see that reason, slow, we see the development of what later will become to know as the liberal solution to religious violence. That is, secularize it. You can keep your religious views private, but in public we will be secular. This sort of liberal solution to the problem of religious violence, which has worked notably well, has also resulted in the idea that reason has a conciliatory nature. Uh, and it also lends itself to eventually the subjectivity of rational process. Okay. Um, so let's move here next. Whoa. I skipped ahead, didn't I? Oh, okay. So here I am. Sorry about that. Uh, so continuing on with the dialect of reason in terms of modern philosophy, one of the other characteristics here is that reason, um, be, as a result, begins to denote the point of view of a scholar, of an intellectual. But there's a sort of divorce here. Objective reasoning is the thing that scholars and intellectuals talk at the university, but objective reason is not something I have to worry about. Um, but you can see here is that what's slowly occurring is that the notion of objective reason is is increasingly becoming an alien conception within the lived day-to-day -day world of the culture of Western Europe and America. Um, so, and we see the rationalist philosophers from Descartes to Spinoza, what we see with them is that reason becomes a means to avoid philosophical skepticism. See, now we're starting to see the increased instrumentalization of reasoning. And for those of you that are familiar with Descartes and Spinoza, we can just say this here is that one of the things Descartes sought to do in his famed meditations was to articulate um, some sort of way in which we could base science on a foundation that could be absolutely certain. Um, and what he does is he first of all subjectivizes the problem by saying that knowledge must begin with the subject, I think therefore I am. So knowledge begins with the subject and reason becomes a means for the subject to finally gain knowledge of the outer world. Now there's still an objective reasoning process involved, but what we see is the slow movement, the slow dialectic, the slow shift of how reason actually operates within our society. Now, that means a, good, a great quote, I love this quote that comes from the Eclipse of Reason. He says, God in the 16th century is retained philosophically, but not grace. I think this is a very interesting, sort of provocative comment by Horkheimer. His idea here is that these philosophers, they still believed in God, but God was a philosophical idea. But the idea here was that reason, natural reason, could explain everything else. We didn't need God to understand science, to understand the mechanics of how the heavenly bodies orbit each other. Right? We don't need to read the Bible to do astronomy. So God is retained philosophically, but the idea that we need God is not. So grace is out. You know, it's a sort of great way of sort of pointing your finger at a very interesting, phenomenal change. Now, what that means is that ethics become secularized. That's the, the secular solution I talked about earlier. And what happens is an entire paradigm in which reason, that is, contemplating and using reason is seen as a way to uncover how we objectively ought to live, 
that whole paradigm just begins to just shatter and crumble. Uh, especially when we think about then uh, the industrialization of society, and then that's when we get the capitalist form of economy engaging, right? Uh, and so what we see here is that the, also, the other important thing here is that individuals are prompted to think for themselves. And that's not a bad thing in itself, but what he wants to do is point out here is that how that figures into the dialect of reasoning, where reasoning is increasingly linked to the individual. Um, okay, now the effects of the Reformation, he says there's two different forces in conflict. Now, for those of you who hopefully you know about the Reformation, and again, if you don't, what I encourage you to do is pause the video and go, go look it up. Um, but the Reformation is essentially um, what occurred, the, the split of the Catholic Church into the Protestant factions. Now, two forces are seem to be converging within the same time period. One is Calvinism. Calvinism was a specific form, uh, is a specific theology from John Calvin, uh, from his book, The Institutes on the Precepts of the Christian Religion, in which Calvin argued essentially a deterministic view of, of the Bible. He argued that God has divine providence, right? God can do anything. God is ruler of all things. But guess what? Since God controls all things and he knows all things, everything that will happen has already happened for God, if you will. Um, and what that means is that we're not free. God's already chosen whether or not we're going to go to heaven or hell. Um, and so there's a sort of determinism that gets set in place with Calvinism. And then the other divergent force here is the increased movement towards empiricism. And empiricism refers to an experienced based, an experiential form of epistemology. So empiricism refers to the idea that how we gain knowledge is through observation of the world. And he thinks that this trend on the one hand of the scientific revolution towards empiricism and this trend of uh, determinism and Calvinism creates a, a, a situation in which in order to solve the tension, religion and science have to become neutralized as, if you will, separate parts of the culture. So previously, right, the idea was that religion and science, all of these things would work together. Uh, because after all, if God created the world and God created reasoning, then all of it should be coherent. But because of these, these trends, what seems to occur, Horkheimer suggests, is that in order to, to keep our religion and keep our science, we essentially compartmentalize them into two separate branches. Um, but, it, but how do we compartmentalize them? Because ultimately reason forces us to confront the idea that there's a contradictory, that they're contradictory, right? Um, but what, what we do is we strip out the objective criteria that reason gives us. That is, reason is formalized. It's through what we what he says, the formalization of reason. Reason becomes a process. It becomes a form of relating ideas, but it's not in itself a means for determining what those ideas are. That is, the formalization of reason, reason becomes, well, I have it right here, don't I? Reason becomes a formal process. Okay? Now, now, where does this move to? Let's talk a little bit about liberalism and tolerance. So this is essentially the story of how slowly we move into um, this instrumental subjective reasoning. And by the way, if you take a look at his book, Dialect of Enlightenment, co-authored with Adorno, you'll find a much more specific, um, uh, rigorously laid out um, dialect, dialectical process of this same stuff we're talking about. Now, it's interesting. What does that mean for liberalism? Liberalism, essentially, in order, liberalism, political liberalism here we're talking about, at its core is this notion of tolerance, right? This idea that we're going to secularize our private beliefs, uh, but allow, I'm sorry, we'll privatize our private beliefs, but and in the public sphere, we'll have secular tolerance. Now, what is tolerance? There's two different meanings for what tolerance might mean. On the one hand, Horkheimer says, uh, tolerance refers to freedom from the rule of dogmatism, right? The idea that I have to believe something just because other people have told me to. Tolerance gives us a way not to, to follow through with dogmatism. So, so that's the sort of positive view of tolerance. But on the other hand, tolerance includes within it what he, what, um, Horkheimer calls something, the idea of the neutralization of spiritual content. That is, uh, tolerance means that we have to become neutral towards, um, towards what we think is necessary 
in our heart of hearts, if you will, I hate using this language, in our heart of hearts in terms of how um, we actually think we should live our lives, that what we might call the spiritual content of our lives. Um, and you have to be careful here. I don't think it's a metaphysical point here. Um, so I don't think he's talking about a spirit in the heavens or something. But I think he's talking about this idea of the passions we have um, towards what we believe is meaningful in life. But tolerance requires us to neutralize that. Um, and this tends towards relativism. And what we see here is an explanation for why most people today, I think, are cultural relativists. That is, they think that a cultural relativist would be a person who says, listen, I don't personally believe in, um, uh, let's see what would be a good example. Um, you could say, for instance, I'm not personally um, gay, but I think that other people can be gay, right? This is a good example of what liberal tolerance looks like. I think in a way that most of us would recognize as a good thing. But you can see here is that it, the, the notion of tolerance itself tends towards relativism, tending towards the idea that I can't make moral judgments. So let's, instead of talking about homosexuality, let me give a different example. Let's say, for instance, um, that I... I that someone in a different culture, for instance, believes that it's okay um, for women to be, um, um, for their genitals to be mutilated. This is called female genital mutilation, also sometimes referred to here as female circumcision. Other cultures in the world do this. We don't like it in general in America because uh, we see it as a way of oppression, a uh, feminine oppression. But the question here is, if we really take this idea of tolerance seriously, that means that reason is neutral to my predispositions against female circumcision, which means that I can't necessarily make moral judgments against it outside of myself. So you can see here is that that means that there's this tension within liberalism. On the one hand, it wants to defend the freedom of others, but on the other hand, it looks like for the liberal, your one's hands get tied behind their back in terms of the capacity to make moral judgments. And this is particularly apt when we think about, of course, capital markets and economic conditions. Okay. Now, the other thing that seems to occur is that self-interest becomes the dominant category of liberalism because if objective reason is no longer the guiding light, if you will, by which I can determine how we should write laws and, and how we should set up our society, then that means all I'm left with is personal self-interest. And so that means that, of course, by the time you get to politics, what you're left with is this idea that politics is just about negotiating interests. Now, what are the consequences of subjective reasoning? Let me go through these, and let me go through them quickly, because I realize I'm taking, I'm actually, I'm already 50 minutes in. Okay, there's a consequence in language. He has this great quote. He says, concepts have become streamlined, rationalized, labor-saving devices. It's as if thinking itself has been reduced to the level of an industrial process, subject to a close schedule, in short, made part and parcel of production. What he wants to argue here is that the, the, the switch of subjective reasoning, the consequences of it, are so innocuous and so... Um, um, so difficult, so penetrating that our very language has changed. Um, where our ideas are actually something like labor saving devices. Um, you can see we're moving here from concepts to what we might call our sound bites, right? Language itself is losing its objective characteristics. And that's because reason and language has become another tool, another way to get, well, my self interest. Now, the, and you can see here, we're slowly beginning to understand maybe why, what, what Horkheimer would say about Hobbes or someone like this, for whom self-interest is such a pertinent category. And this means we also initiate an era of relativism where ideas become something like advertisements, right? That is, when I give an idea, my idea is, is rhetorical, right? I'm trying to convince others to agree with me. I'm not necessarily trying to convince them that it's actually true. But that's because the objective criteria of reason itself is gone. So all I'm left with is power relations in which I'm trying to convince others to agree with my own emotive self-interest. Right Here we get this great quote, The difference between thinking and acting is held void in this situation. Thus, ev um, every thought is regarded as an act, every reflection a thesis, every thesis a watchword. 
As soon as a thought or a word becomes a tool, one can dispense with actually thinking it. That is, going through the logical acts involved in verbal formation. So one of the things he thinks occurs is that because language and becomes simply a tool, what ends up happening is that we end up so we end up by not thinking because I don't need to repeat the thinking process again if that's not what my subjective goal is or if that subjective goal has already been attained. You can see here what we end up with is we end up with a situation in which reason in which we're just not thinking anymore, right? Uh, because reason is just a, a process. And so if I don't need the process enacted, why do it? Right? Uh, if someone else has already thought this out, why not just you know stick with them? You can see this is reinforcing a process of non-thought. Reason becomes a fetish, right? And when to say reason becomes a fetish is to say that reason um, reason takes on a, a life character that's not its own. Um, so let's keep moving on here. I, I'm just running out of time, but what is the relation between science and ethics here? Uh, you can see there's a couple. I, I'm noticing as I do this, I hate it. I always see these spelling errors. Uh, part of the problem I had is when I did the spell check, for some reason, my whole thing stuck on German, and I couldn't undo it, um, the spell checker. So, um, science, but what happens is that in our society now, science has become the sole authority, right? Science has become the sole authority. I can't stand it. I have to fix this. Science becomes the sole authority for determining what's actually true. And th I think most of us would probably agree with this, right? But this means that science also supplants old values and cherished beliefs because science is a system of empirical classifications, right? That's the movement we talked about earlier. But that means that science is neutral to the question of ethics and justice, right? Think about the question, why is justice better than injustice? Science is neutral to that question. It isn't necessarily better for the scientist. It's not a real question, real scientific question. And if science is our sole authority, then that means, and reason doesn't have an objective character to help us answer these questions, that means that ultimately these philosophical debates that you see that are so classical, things like the question of justice, simply just drop out of the equation and a great danger gets announced here right because when reason becomes emasculated it becomes subject to ideological manipulation that is subject reason subjective reasoning will conform to anything okay and he says that on 17. now think about it that means that that we can use re reason can get hijacked by ideology and in fact i think that's what is probably happening in large measure within our current political sphere of activity. For instance, when you see campaigns, you, you see politicians arguing for all sorts of different things. Question is, how can they do that if there's objective reasoning? Answer is, there isn't. Um, and so what it is, is there's a certain ideological perspective and they're gonna use whatever reasons they can to maintain that ideology. Um, and so I think most people by and large would agree that we have an ideological situation, at least in the United States' political sphere currently. And reason, and the reason that is allowed to happen, Horkheimer is suggesting, is because reason has lost its objective criteria. Now, that means quite unintentionally, the Enlightenment has resulted in the liquidation of reason itself, uh, which is a very you know, vicious sort of problem, because if we think back in the Enlightenment, that means the Enlightenment itself has been undercut. Now, what are the political consequences? Because we've been talking about society and reason and all this stuff. Let's think about the political, con co political consequences in a little bit more detail. The first thing to note here is that the social contract theorists are responsible. People like John Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau, they all believed that we had needed objective reasoning Otherwise, the social contract won't work. I mean, consider John Locke's defense of the majority rule. The reason he thinks that the majority, we should respect the majority rule, is because he believes he has this notion of what he calls natural reason, not nation, but notion. Uh, a notion of natural reason, of natural law. We talked about it in our lecture. But you can see here that if 
that that is the notion of objective reasoning, right? The idea that through reason I can determine naturally what should be the case. This is now gone. All I'm left with is my personal subjective desires, self-interest, and then I'm going to use my reason to attain those. And so you can see here that under those conditions, the majority rules idea begins to falter, right? So we can't blame the social contract theorists, but we can see that social contract theory is undercut by the uh, uh, instantiation of subjective reasoning. Because without objective reasoning, Horkheimer tells us, the democratic principle becomes entirely dependent upon the interest of the people. And these interests are economic in character. So you can see here, this is why and how um, the social contract can be hijacked by economic um, economic conditions. And because reason is no longer, if you will, a threshold where we can moderate self-interest with what would be objectively um, the right thing to do or whatever, right? So you can see here that the democratic principle gets essentially thwarted into purely a system of self-interest um, without objective reasoning. So, and that means finally there's no guarantee against tyranny. Reason will not protect us, right? Uh, because if it's within the economic or other interest of, of, of a majority, um, tyr and if tyranny is, uh, if there's reason to commit tyranny, then we will commit tyranny. Because objective reasoning, without objective reason, there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with tyranny because, again, subjective reasoning is neutral to concepts and thus neutral to the concept of tyranny itself. So that means there's no, uh, there's no, there's no guarantee against tyranny. And you can see here, he ultimately is going to argue this is what is behind what occurred um, in the Holocaust and what occurred in the Second World War. Now, regarding the United States in particular, um, um, Horkheimer has great he, he, he has great admiration for the framers of the United States because he sees that the framers they had a, they crafted a system of majority rule but they engineered an ingenious system of checks and balances so as to moderate um, that majority rule towards interest but they always assume that there would be objective reasoning, right? And he gives this example of John Adams, for instance, refers to certain intuitive truths. All you need to do here is go read uh, the Federalist Papers to see that there's an assumption of objective reasoning. But because objective reasoning no longer has its claws in the, in the situation, if you will, right? Because reason has become liquidated. That means that the intuitive truths embedded in our social inheritance have, are severed, right? These intuitive truths that, that John Locke believed that we would naturally aim, that we would naturally organize ourselves around, th those intuitive truths have gone. They're liquidated. Um, so you can see here that the sort of uh, criteria that Adams believed and Locke would believe guide us, natural reason here, is no longer available. And if it's no longer available, then that means the defense against tyranny, uh, well, is gone too, okay? So, that means, and he also says this, which I think really resonates with me, public opinion becomes a substitute for reason under these conditions and within the United States. And that seems to be, I don't know, right on the mark. Um, because it looks like increasingly that, I mean, if you just click on any, you know, political news channel and listen to what they have to say, they're almost always talking about public opinion polls about, for instance, the new healthcare law or about the war or this or that. We're looking at public opinion polls. But when do public opinion polls tell me what objectively is the right thing to do? And the answer is they don't tell us anything objective. They simply tell us what people's interests are at any given moment. Uh, but wait a second. Now it seems like we're in a situation in which the, which the public opinion seems to be uh, has seems to have become the criteria for legitimate legislation. And that's very dangerous um, because after all, we shouldn't forget that the reason the Nazis were able to do what they did is precisely because they had public opinion on their side. Uh, but just because the public opinion is on your side doesn't mean that it's actually a good thing to do. That doesn't mean that the, what, the political result will be actually desirable. And, and so discourse gets transformed into propaganda.
conversations get transformed into rhetoric, right? Um, we don't, in the Senate today, we don't see discourse. What we see is uh, we see propaganda towards specific interest, special interest, we call them. Uh, so, and Horkheimer provides us a framework for understanding that. Now, what are some of the other problems generated by subjective reasoning? Well, obviously, there is the problem of values emerges. For instance, how do we value things is no longer an easy way to do using subjective reasoning. Because, for instance, for this person who uses subjective reason, what makes an artist better than a, pr a murderer who's in prison making license plates? Well, the artist may make paintings but no one's ever going to buy those paintings. And if they're not going to buy them, then they're not contributing to the economic system, to self-interest, the social self-interest system. Uh, which means that it looks like the, to be a murderer in prison making license plate is more productive economically and thus should be considered to be more valuable. Um, this, right, so obviously no one wants to say that. But the question is, how can we argue in favor of the value of the artist if all we have is subjective reason? Uh, and I think there's a pretty important point. Now, it also means we have a recognition problem. And this problem I really want to highlight for you. Um, here, read this quote from 22. Quote, If a group of enlightened people were about to find even the greatest evil imaginable, subjective reason would make it almost impossible to point simply to the nature of the evil and to the nature of humanity, uh, which make the fight imperative. Many would ask at once, what are what the real motives are um, now what is he arguing here what he's talking about is the idea that with because subjective reason is essentially neutral to value and neutral to situations that means that in a in a political situation if we're confronted with a great evil um, because of the neutrality of our reason it becomes almost impossible for us to point at and even recognize that evil. In fact, you you can see this, for instance, when the United States, and, and we can disagree about this. I, I don't know if, this is just an example. I'm not necessarily going to argue that this is the case. But think about, for instance, um, the late 90s in the genocide of Rwanda. The United States didn't do anything, even though it watched on television as people were hacked to death by machetes. Why didn't we do anything? We're, we're we couldn't recognize a great evil, Horkheimer would tell us. Because for us, the question is interest. Well, why should we get involved? How is it in the United States' interest to jump in and get involved in a war? What's interesting, I think, Horkheimer is noting is that when we, when we frame the discussion in terms of interest in that way, uh, in terms of motive, what what we're doing is we're dropping out of the equation the idea that we even can recognize an evil that should be stopped, um, and I think now I don't I don't know if that's a good example that I just gave here, but I think this is an interesting problem because if this is the case, then that means there may be great um, civil injustices, great evils currently being committed, of which our society, our paradigm is unable to recognize. And actually, I think that's what he believes, especially when we talk about the capitalist market economy in which you see the polarization of the classes. Or, you know, from the Marxist perspective, I think that's what they'd argue. Now, if you're not a Marxist, that's fine. But entertain that question, though, at least. What sort of evils might be committed today that we simply don't recognize? Because they don't figure within our subjective, within... Um, our interest in our use of subjective reasoning. That's a really interesting question. Now, that means that ultimately for the Horkheimer says, um, liberal democratic civil rights become imperiled. And the process of subjective reasoning ultimately culminates in totalitarianism. And we can talk about that later. But ultimately, the reason he has the Nazis on the cover of the book is because he thinks this is what led precisely to the Nazis. And what precisely led to the inability of the German people to recognize the great evils they were confronting um, and to do nothing. And so that's a really, I think, an important existential point for us to think about. Now, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to briefly talk about um, Her Herbert Marcuse and his book, Counter-Revolution Revolt. And I gave you a short excerpt to look in that, and I'm going to run through it.
Herbert Marcuse, by contrast, is much more, his discussion is not about reason per se, though he'll end on that point. His question is really, how can we, um, how can we fight this problem? How can we revolt against it? <laughs> um, and I'm not arguing that we should revolt against it, or even that he's right about the problem, but I think that this question of revolution is important and interesting, because I think most people today um, certainly recognize that there needs to be political movement on so many problems, and there's not any political movement. It looks like we need some sort of revolution, um, nonviolent or otherwise. So what does he say here? Number one, revolution requires a spontaneous liberation from what has been made of them in, that, in the society in which they live. Uh, that's not a very good quote on 46. But what he says here is, before there can be a revolution, uh, what there first has to be is the is we have to begin to liberate ourselves from what we what our society has made of us instrumentally how we've been um, our reason has been liquidated to use the horror crimers um, configuration here right we've been made into workers workers that don't have value right that only have interested value economically so the before we can change the situation we have to first change ourselves in the situation that's what he's talking about there and so he what he thinks is what that what we need is we need an intense counter education and counter organization um, he thinks the goal of the counter revolution is the establishment of new relations and these are very interesting one we need free relations among individuals his idea here is that because of this process of alienation that we talked about last time with Marx we are not in uh, we do not have free relations with each other our relations are always moderated or mediated through economic um, criteria and the second thing we need is we need new relations with nature and without doubt there's a total dis um, devastating crisis ecologically that's occurring right now so um, I don't think any of us can deny the need for determining new relations in nature because at this point we're headed towards global um, catastrophe if we don't do anything. Now, now it's interesting here, we've talked about the dialect of reason, um, but now he mentions there's also a dialect of liberation. This is the process. That is, liberation doesn't come in one day, right? Remember the thesis, antithesis, synthesis movement we talked about with Hegel and Marx. This is, there's also a liberation dialectic. So there's no immediate transition from the needs we have um, as human beings uh, in terms of alienation and this stuff to the political goals of actually getting this stuff to change. This takes time. Revolution, a la the dialect of liberation, requires, the comp requires people to comprehend contradictions, right? He's almost precisely going back to this notion of the dialectic in Hegel. But what he thinks here is that what we need is we need to recognize the contradictory nature within our forms of life. And this, of course, invites us into this key problem of consciousness. And you can see here, uh, here, here he is as a Frankfurt School thinker. Now, what makes a revolution a revolution, though? A revolutions must revolutions must revolutionize the human being. Um, that is, a revolution isn't simply a revolution because we change some things. What has to be fundamentally changed is the relationships the human beings have with each other and have with nature. And so, for instance, he talks about the sexual revolution. And the idea here is that the sexual revolution was not a revolution. Um, quote, for instance, the sexual re revolution is no revolution if it does not become a revolution of the human being. If sexual re revolution liberation does not converge with political morality. And here, let me just put it in this way. This is not exactly how Horkheimer frames it, but I think you would agree with the analysis. Is think about the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution is cl closely linked uh, with the women's liberation movement, in which the idea is that human beings uh, should be liberated to freely pursue their sexual interests, right? Um, essentially, that is... Uh, we should be able to have sex outside of marriage if we want, and so we can be homosexual, um, so on and so forth. You can see the whole LB, LBG, LBGT community, the lesbian, bisexual, gay, transgender community, is, is, is historically contingent upon the sexual revolution in the late 60s. But what he's arguing here is that what did the sexual revolution do? Well, it liberated women, but what did it liberate women and men into? It liberated them into actually um, more and more economic control. Because um, now think about it. 
Now women, now this is more the women's liberation movement, but it's worth thinking about. That, and, and by the way, I'm a fan of women's liberation and feminism. I think that women should be liberated from these sorts of exterior political constraints. But when we actually look at what happened in the United States, what we discover is that um, what it meant, women's liberation and sexual revolution, revolution meant in the long run, is that women got to go to work. And they got to be they got to become a part of the economic engine, and that's not in itself a bad thing. But now women don't have a choice but to become members of the economic system. You can see that the uh, the sexual revolution in the '60s actually seemed to have the reverse effect, not an effect of liberation, but actually of of actually adding more economic change to us as individuals. So it's interesting here because. I think that while Marcuse, for instance, would would be um, sympathetic with the sexual revolution, he ultimately doesn't see it as a revolution because it doesn't change fundamentally our relations with each other. It does change some of our relations be among human beings, but it doesn't change the most important, which are our economic relations. If anything, it's actually increasingly tethered our economic relations and made it worse um, because now... Um, well, anyway, I won't keep talking about it, but the more I personally contemplate, the more I see uh, the sexual revolution and also the the um, the work currently of the LBGT community is consistently being co-opted by economic um, factors, by economic interest. And if that's the case, it's not a liberation, uh, or at least not in this front for school sense, okay? Now, in terms of democracy and revolution, what does Marcuse argue? He says, the necessity of revolution is mounting, though. Increasingly, we're seeing this because the capitalist enterprise is rapidly approaching its inherent limits on a global scale and resorting to intensified violence and intensified co-option. Now, what's one way in which this is true? Um, well, one way is think about the natural limits, right? If everyone in the world lived, uh, the way Americans do in terms of how much stuff we consume, we would need three more planets. Think about it. There's not enough resources on the planet for everyone in the world to live in an economy like the United States' economy. So the capitalist enterprise has inherent internal limits, and it's approaching those. Um, at least mater there are material limits, too. Now, today the revolution, though, is in a pubertarian stage and needs a spirit of seriousness. And I think he would say the same thing about, for instance, the Occupy Wall Street movement we saw, which I'm deeply sympathetic with, right? But simply standing around um, and waving one's fingers and allowing people to speak, well, that's certainly um, a good thing in one sense. Is this... This seems sort of almost like an immature type of revolution. It seems like we need a little bit more seriousness. Um, um, at least I think that's what he would argue here. Now, to be fair, Marcuse is actually talking about uh, the the sense of um, revolution that's occurring in the late 60s and the early 70s when he's writing this book. But I think he would see the Occupy Wall Street movement and maybe the Tea Party movement in the same way, both of them. Um, the Tea Party movement's even worse off, probably in his view, because they don't recognize the economic problems. Um, but anyway, we won't get into all that stuff. Number three, democracy, though, provides a structural hope. So Marcuse is actually optimistic when he thinks about democracy, because democracy provides hope because it provides the, uh, the possibility of creating structures of autonomous local bases. That is, there's ways of getting outside of the sort of top-down economic control we see. So democracy is, our, is actually our means to of escape, if you will. And he sees the universities and college education as part of this program for counter-revolution. He writes, the dominion of this democracy still leaves room for the building of autonomous local bases. The increasing technological scientific requirement of production and control makes the universities into such a base. So he sees university education, college education, is precisely the, 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 the type and form of institution where it's possible to actually begin um, to actually make movement in this problem of consciousness, right? Because he thinks that we can have a concerted effort to build up these counter institutions, and universities are particularly adept at of handling, or at least 
uh, engage in this problem of consciousness. Because we, and we should also promote more non-authoritarian forms of learning, and we should promote and promote decisive student participation. And I'll say here, at least on our college campus, I'm to, to some, I'm, I'm very much disturbed by how little student political participation we see. Um, you know, I have to, I'll just be frank. When I walk through the student union of the college, what I see is I see most students playing video games, um, entertaining themselves with World of Warcraft or, or whatever games they're playing. And I'm not against entertainment or against video games, but there's a, there's a problem when um, I don't see any political activity or any student political participation in the student union today. Uh, what I see is consumption. I see economic consumption, the consumption of the Xbox and, and, um, and the PlayStation. But what I don't see is I don't see movement and activity towards really revolutionizing the relationships we have with human beings. Um, I don't see any of that. And so I think there's a real impetus on students here. And so if you're a student listening to this, I think the, the baton is being handed to you um, and the question, and it looks like for the most part, well, we've just we're just selling the baton to the highest bidder. Um, and so I think there's a real message here for students, actually, and that's one of the reasons I picked this piece for us to read. Um, so he, there's this final quote here, um, which we'll end with here, which is where he argues, "For history indeed repeats itself, and it is this repetition of domination and submission that must be halted." And halting it presupposes knowledge of its genesis and of the ways in which it is reproduced. Critical thinking. Now, whoa, this is count this is counter-revolutionary here, because what is he arguing? Recall with Herbert Marcuse, we talked about subjective reasoning. Today, in the modern academy, there's a lot of emphasis being placed on the idea that we need to promote critical thinking. And as a philosophy professor, my job is almost dominated by the idea of helping to promote critical thinking in my students. Now, what's Marcuse saying here? Marcuse is saying is this promotion of critical thinking, when we understand it in terms of it being forms of subjective reason, is ultimately to actually help reproduce um, this domination of submission, the repetition of domination and submission. Um, so, uh, so this is a pretty important feature here. This is a call to arms, if you will, an invocation to consider that maybe one of the problems here is that, that we're involved in teaching critical thinking, but when we think critical thinking, we're talking about means and instrumental thinking, we're not interested in articulating some sort of objective reason. And, and so he sees here that the universities have sort of a, a double um, problem. It's a two-edged sword. On the one hand, the universities have the means for liberation. And on the other hand, the universities and colleges are at present actually reinforcing this system of ideology and domination through very what seems like innocuous practices of promoting critical thinking. So you can see here, this is a very provocative idea. Um, so, um, and I think the way we can enter that line is to understand it from the Horkheimer perspective. Okay, so, but that's a little bit um, about, that's, we're going to conclude our introduction to social and political philosophy and critical theory here. Um, now, with that thought, and I'll leave you with the, really a question for you to consider, um, no matter where you're at on the political spectrum, right? no matter what you believe politically, and that's this, is um, what way, in what ways are you being taught and indoctrinated into systems that you find morally objectionable? And where, where is that occurring? Is that occurring in the universities? Is it occurring in the media? These are very important questions, and these are pertinent questions of consciousness and these forms of consciousness that exist within our society. And I think and the idea here is that these forms of consciousness are ultimately disrupting the promise of democracy. Okay, that's Critical Theory, and I'm Mark Thorsby. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys online next time.